our prayer book. It is prayed for every day, uh, several times a week. If you put your name in here, and if you will send Woody a good address so you can get the decal, and you can put it, no decal. That's mine. Oh, here it is. A decal with a good address and Woody will send it to you. And uh, you can put it on your car or on your refrigerator. Gentlemen, remove your hats, please. Mm. Heavenly Father, please uh, pray for our country, our churches and our church, our children, Trail Live, and American Heritage Girl. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. I'm bringing extra water. Um, I love the weather change to a point, but my body does not love it a lot of times. It just, I, I, it's amazing how much stuff can go in this one head. It just keeps being there. I have to wonder sometimes if there's anything else up there, and I'm sure a lot of y'all wonder that too, but that's, that's a story for another day. Um, uh, well, I know, I know. <laughs> And that's, that's why I have notes everywhere. I have notes in my phone. I have notes hanging around the house because I can't keep anything in my memory. Um, it is really good to see everybody here. Pastor Woody said it was time for me to get up here and speak again. Uh, and I'm thankful uh, the Lord has given me a, a message. And, and Woody was nice enough to give me two weeks because as Pastor Woody will tell you, when you're planning for a sermon and you start putting it together, God will go, no, you need to do this. So the original sermon that I had planned on preaching on, we'll, we'll cover a little bit of it today, but, but it's actually going to be next week. In the preparation for next week, I've got today's sermon. So, and, uh, and I guess if God pushes it, he may have to give me a third week. You know, we can only do what God tells us to do. And, that, and that's the important part about this is, yes, sir. Do we have kids? I guess we do have some kids. Well, mine, apparently, nobody told him it was time to come in here, so he's back there watching TV. So, and I would like to say that if any of y'all see my grandson, Bobby, who's not in here when we start service, get him in here. He needs to be in here. Um, he's a great kid, but he will, he will uh, try to uh, skirt things as much as he possible. So, yes, before we get started, I see we have some kids in here today. I'm going to uh, dismiss them and pray up the, the children's ministry. If, gentlemen, if you'll remove your hats. Dear Lord... We thank you again for allowing us to come before you and just stand here. We thank you for these children that are here, be it young, be it older. They are the future of our country. They are the future of, of telling your story, Lord. And it's important that we as adults teach them to tell your story. Uh, there's too many people out there now who feel like it's not their business to talk to other people about you, but we know that's not true. Jesus told us firmly to go out and speak to um, our local people are in, in spread out above uh, to other people. Uh, we thank you for allowing us to uh, serve these children. We thank you for allowing us to serve these people. I ask that you'll lay your hands upon me, Lord. Um, use me to deliver the message you won't deliver. Do not allow me to step away from that in one way or the other, Lord. Just keep me on task and keep me focused on that, Lord. I just thank you for the message you give me. I thank you for allowing me to be in this pulpit and to deliver this message. And I just ask that you'll open the hearts and minds of everybody in this church, in this building, and who is watching right now or who will watch in the future to do, get from the message which you have uh, deemed they should get. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you are under the age of 50, <laughs> go to Children's Church. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, but the Lord works in, in, and we all know the Lord works in mysterious ways. And when he starts to talk to you, what you think he wants to tell you to begin with, a lot of times will lead off in another direction. Um, when I was preparing, actually, and, and um, Brother Brent had mentioned RCC TV, today is, Woody is starting a new book in the book of Galatians. So if, if, if everybody needs more Bible study. 
So remember that we have the RCC TV. It is released at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings, but it is ultimately always there on YouTube. If you're not sure where to go to see it, go to rockandcountrychurch.com. We have a link to all our Bible studies, the Wednesday Bible studies, the Sunday services, and um, Pastor Woody's uh, RCC TV, which I guess it's ours now since we're both sharing time uh, upstairs in the, in the pulpit, and I'm so blessed to be able to do that. Uh, so if you need more study, in, which we all do, uh, look into that. But I, last week, had finished up the book of Jude, and when I was doing the study on the book of Jude, I come across a gentleman who was talking about false teachers, because that's what 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude, along with Peter, and actually, if you really dig into it, most of the New Testament talks about false teachers. And false teachers aren't always somebody who purposely comes to you and goes, that's not Jesus, that's not God. Some false teachers just don't understand the scriptures, and they bring it to you improperly. And that's why it's important for each one of us to have Bible study, to read Bibles, and to not just depend on one person, not to just depend on Pastor Woody or me or, or whoever your favorite pastor is on TV. It's important that we get outside that because the Holy Spirit within us is going to give us the discernment. But especially if you're a new follower, you have to learn how to hear the Holy Spirit because he's not going to drag you kicking and screaming. God gives us free will, so he allows us to do the things that we want to do, so we have to learn these things. But as I was going through the studying for that, um, he was giving examples of how modern Christianity is being wooed away from solid doctrine through different ways. Um, and worship is, of course, the main way, because worship is what everything we do is. Um, the the rabbit hole I went down was on the music side, and that's what we will talk about next week because I think it's important that we understand why and how and, and, and of worship, not just what it is, but how God wants us to do it. And that's a large part of it because when you speak of worship and praise, the first thing people think of is what me and my wife just did, getting up there and singing. But that's not all of it. It's a big part of it, but that's not all of it. Um, so... What is worship? What, when we think of worship, what is the act of worship? We, will go, we begin every Sunday with worship. That's how every Sunday morning begins here at Rock and Country Church. And most churches do the same thing, be it if they have a band or they have a choir or however they do it. But everything we do should begin with worship of some type, be it music or prayer or things like that. So as I went through this, the more I studied, and, and, and one thing I have found since Pastor Woody asked me to be associate pastor and digging deeper into study is English does not do the Bible justice. We have, I don't want to say it's a simple language, but it's a simple language. Um, I know people say sometimes it's hard to learn, but in, in like with worship, we'll, we'll start with this word. Our definition of worship in the English language is the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity, which is God, our worship of God. The verb is show reverence and adoration for a deity, honor with religious rites. And, and that sounds good. But in Hebrew, there's several words. And I've got three here uh, that they use in Hebrew that were used in the Old Testament. And again, I don't speak Hebrew, so um, just bear with me on the words. Uh, the first one is Saul Gad, and that is to prostrate oneself. We hear prostate. Uh, we hear to pro prostrate. Prostate. You're good. You're good. <laughs> Those are two totally different words. <laughs> to prostate. Prost. I can't. Prostrate. <laughs> to prostrate. Well, I'm telling you, my tongue, buddy, I tell you, my tongue swells up when I get up here. It's Hebrew, it's Hebrew yeah. But, um, but to prostrate oneself, and we hear prostrate throughout the Bible, so I wanted to give the definition of that. I think most of us know what it is, but when you hear somebody prostrates, trait, prostrates, I didn't think that word would be one I'd have trouble with. Um, it's lying at length with the body extended face down on the ground or other service, lying at mercy as supplicant, lying in a posture of humility and adoration. So that's what prostrate 
means. Wow. Um, okay, so the second one is I'll stab, uh, and that's to fabricate or fashion. And the third is shawl call, and that's to prostrate, and I even spelled it wrong, to prostrate in homage, reverence to God, or devote affection, or devout affection. This term is commonly used uh, to describe bowing in worship or respect of the Almighty God. To show reverence and adoration is the ultimate of what worship really is. But to me, you say that, and it's still, what does that really mean? I think the definition of lying extended face down on the ground is much more descriptive than just having adoration. This gives a physical of what we do. And you see, you see this throughout the Bible. Abraham did it. Um, wow. Uh, Israel did it. I mean, anybody who saw the face of God or come before the glory of God the Bible says they fell prostrate on the ground. <coughs> uh, now, how many people actually get prostrate when praying or worshiping God? I know I don't do it nowhere near enough. There's many cases when I should, but I don't because we don't, in, in the modern church, I don't think we think of it that way. Um, and that's, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Um, I do know a few men, especially in my men's group that I go to after church on Sundays a lot of times, that when we are praying and worshiping, they do literally fall on the ground, face down, and worship God. Um, that is the ultimate in showing your um, love of God. Um, these definitions are words from the Old Testament, and many will say that everything has changed. We are uh, under a new one, under a new uh, covenant. And it's true to a point, but we have the Old Testament because God hasn't changed. He's the exact same God today he was when he created Adam and Eve. There's no difference. The way we come to him is different, and that's the important part. Um, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And that's from Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Since the beginning of time, we have all worshipped. We all worship something. There's not a person in here or outside these doors who doesn't worship something. It's what they worship. What's the most important thing in their life? Is it their car? Is it their child? Is it their job? We all worship. But we're called to worship God. That's what we were created to do. But today, we're going to focus strictly on the worship of God. Um, as with most of the things we talk about, there's a sermon in almost every other word we talk about. Uh, and I thought when I started doing this that coming up with sermons was going to be difficult, but I have found out that there's a sermon in everything. Um, my wife's always uh, aware of that. She, I think, knows that there's always a sermon in the family. There's always a sermon uh, at work. It's just, it's, it's observing and God giving you this information. And again, when we think of worship, I think we all believe, we all focus on music because that is where we hear it the most. And we'll discuss a lot of aspects of the music next week. But worship, for the most part, is more than music. It, it's much more than music. As Paul says, uh, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. He says that in Colossians 3, chapter 3, verse 23. We should worship the Lord in everything we do. When we get out of bed in the morning. And it's not just the act of doing it. It's we should do it. As we're driving our car, when somebody cuts us off, we all need to worship the Lord. Because uh, that will get away from you really fast in this fast-paced world, especially if you drive to Dallas like me and many of you I know do. Uh, but it's very important that we remember we don't just see God when we come here on Sundays. We don't just see God when we're watching Bible study, listening to Bible study. Every time... Every time, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you're at, no matter who you are, God is there. The Holy Spirit is only within us who believe and have given our, 
ourselves to God. But God is everywhere. He's omniscient. No matter where you go, he is there. You cannot get away from him. Well, I guess once you pass and go into the burning lake of fire and sulfur, then God's not there because God can't be around sin. <coughs> I'm sorry. Boy, I tell you, this, this weather, it seems to always kick up when I'm going to be up here uh, preaching. Uh, when we come to church, and, and today we'll kind of focus on church also, every part of it's worship. When you come in the door, uh, when we're singing, when, when me and my wife or somebody else is singing, when me or Pastor Woody is here in this pulpit, when we have our invitation, when we have our closing song, every part of what we do is worship. It's not just in the music. When, when Pastor Woody or myself brings the message, we're bringing you God's word. And that is meant to be worshiped. Um, and it doesn't always resonate in everybody the same way because a message that Pastor Woody may be preaching may really, God is focused on one person in the congregation. And everybody else hears it, but they don't grab onto it. And then there's times when every person in the congregation grabs onto it. It just depends on what God feels like we need to do. When people see us in church, out of church, wherever we may go, they should see something different. They should know that we're different. The Holy Spirit within us and, and, and the power Jesus has given us and the fact that we are worshiping even when we're walking down the road, we should resonate the light of that. And that is why we are called to do what we are called to do, is we are not Jesus. And we are not a replacement for Jesus. But when Jesus left this world, his ministry fell upon us. Jesus constantly worshiped. Um, even when he wasn't off praying, when he was teaching, when he was preaching, when he was doing these things, it was all for God. And we do it for God because we're worshiping God. If we act and people see us as just another person on the street, then we act like the other people in the street. We act like the lost people. And we don't want to do that because when we act like those people, it's like I said, when you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off, you need to worship. If you act like the other guy who doesn't have God, then people look at you like you're just like anybody else, which means you're doing the natural, normal thing. And we're not natural, normal people. We are meant to be supernatural, to be spiritual people. We should always look different. Because when people look upon us, if they see that we're like everybody else, then they think our God's nothing special. That our God can't do extraordinary things because look at George over there. Look at, look at John over there. You know, look at these people who claim to be Christians, but all week long they act just like their co-workers, hooting and hollering, hollering at women, doing these things. That's not what we're called to do. We are, we are called to be different. Because if in our lives, our worship, we're not different, then how can other people really see the Jesus that we talk about? Because words are just words. You can tell me all day long who you are, but if I spend time with you, I will see who you are. Because uh, we're going to always come back and act like the person we truly are. And that's a scary thing if you think about it. Because when you start spending time with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and I think in a lot of ways, this is why a lot of people don't come to a lot of events. And I'm not judging anybody, but you know the more you spend, more time you spend with somebody, they're going to know you. My wife knows me better than anybody else because I spend every day with her. We rarely, I mean, I go to work, but I mean, as far as I'm really not home at night, so we're at home together all the time. And she's going to know me a whole lot better than Barry does. And me and Barry spend a good bit of time together. We're here on Sundays. We're here on Tuesdays. We do men's stuff together. Me and Brent, um, we spend time together. Me and Pastor Woody now are spending a lot of time together. Makes me nervous. You know. <laughs> am I being who I, I think I am? And, and a lot of times that's as, as much as anything. Are you being who you think you are? Most think that if they have successfully worshipped, that they'll feel good, that emotionally they will be fulfilled 
and they and if they didn't enjoy the worship then they go home going well I just didn't get nothing out of it but it's not about us it's about God Amen. and we're not always going to feel refreshed and feel lifted up and feel just wonderful about it we're not always going to like the songs that are sung up here we're not always going to like the message that Pastor Woody brings um, he doesn't he doesn't sugarcoat it uh, and that's why I'm here because there's far too many pastors out there today who do sugarcoat it um, but we have to remember that no matter how we feel that we received that we need to put out we need to give we need to give that praise and worship to God because that is the most important thing because some people, you know, they didn't like the songs we play. They don't like, somebody didn't say hello to them this morning. They, they just feel like that they were not um, lifted up on their self at church. And that's why a lot of people church hop. They're going, they're looking for what makes them happy. Right. And we want to enjoy our church family. We were here last night doing uh, a Valentine's thing. We were here Thursday. Uh, Michael Wordman back there is doing the Prayer Warrior. We were here praying. They were here Wednesday doing Bible study. On Tuesday, we were here with the boys and the girls with American Heritage Girls and Trail Life. We're here most days. And that doesn't mean you have to be here every day, but we would like for you to want to be here. But again, each time we get together, it's, it's about God. Uh, last night, we had fun, you know, as couples and, and, and some of the singles that was here. But, but ultimately, we were, we were glorifying God by being here and, and lifting each other up. Uh, you know, we try to do that in the music. I, I thought about some songs back when I was younger that we played on Valentine's Day. We don't play those in church. So, you know, those are the kind of things that we have to really think about when we're going. Um, we are not here to satisfy ourselves. We are here to serve God. Um we all get fed differently. I don't know. You know I've talked to many of y'all, and, and I believe that. That's when people start talking about church. I do believe that each person is fed differently. That's why we have Don Griffin up at Hillcrest. We have uh, Pastor Paul Roberts at River of Life, and we have Don Kyle over at New Life, uh, his is New Life Family Worship. And people go there because they are fed a certain way. Y'all come here because Pastor Woody feeds y'all a certain way. It's important that we receive the message the way we can understand it. There's a lot of churches out there with a lot of good pastors, but if he's up there on the pulpit and he's preaching and you're going, what? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't help you. And, and the Holy Spirit is within you to help you understand, but the Holy Spirit is also going to lead you to churches that will help you understand. Again, it's not about you, but God is going to make sure you're where you need to be. And that, and that comes in so many different forms of not just being at the church, it's being in the church, being in the building, being part of the congregation, serving, and that's part of worship. We do a lot of, everybody in this church is a volunteer. Nobody is in full-time ministry here. We'd like to be, but Pastor Woody has 15 different jobs. I mean, he's always doing something. I have my own job. I work a 40-hour week. Most everybody here does. So... We are volunteers, but we have to remember that we're not just volunteers. We get to volunteer. We get to serve the Lord. And in that service, that is part of our worship. That is, our, uh, that is probably our biggest part of worship. It's bigger than t singing. It's bigger than me standing up here preaching. The things I do outside of this, the people I serve, that is my worship of the Lord. Because we show the Lord our love by serving other people. It's so important because that's why we were all put here together. We're not here to be standing alone. But as I said, you know, these godly men, they, they preach the Bible just like Pastor Woody does, just like myself does. But some people get their message more clearly from them. And if they don't, then they can come here because Pastor Woody will tell you. <laughs> um, another aspect of, of people who go looking for worship is they want to be entertained. And we don't want people to watch us while we're singing and going, what are those idiots doing? But we're not here to entertain. We're not on this stage to make y'all feel good. 
we're on this stage leading worship. That's why all our words are up here on, on the screen. It's important for y'all to know what you're singing because it's really important for us to know what we're bringing to you because there's, and we'll get into this next week, but there is a lot of new worship music that if you read the words, it's not biblically sound. And again, we'll get deeper into that next week, but it's important, just like you reading your Bible, it's important that you know what we're singing and it's important for you to sing. And there's a lot of people say they can't sing. Well, you know what? God hears a joyful noise. It doesn't matter how bad it is. And I've been out in the congregation, and I'm not going. I'm not going to speak of anybody here, but I know I've been in other churches where I'm going. Okay. But we have to remember that we're all lifting the Lord up, and and as a whole, because there's nothing that me and Lori we have discovered. It, it, you know, over the time of us singing, that there is nothing better than standing up there and hearing y'all over us, because that means. We are worshiping as, as an entity, as, as a family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm getting way off my notes, so you all just have to forgive me when I start looking to make sure. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff up here, but apparently it's not a memory. Um, worship's not about the, the worshiper. It's, it's about God. It's always about God. Uh, if everybody would go ahead and turn over to Exodus chapter 20. Yeah, I'm finally going to get get to to a to a verse here. Um, God is pretty clear about Him being worshipped here in the Bible. Uh, the one thing about our God is He don't mince words. He don't beat around the bush. He is very clear about who He is and what He wants. So we're going to be in Exodus chapter ten. I mean chapter twenty. I'm sorry. We're going to talk about the, the Ten Commandments because I feel like that's the best place to start in worship. But we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20 and we're going to start in verse 1. I need some light. <coughs> Exodus is after Genesis. <laughs> All right. And God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I am, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and to keep my commandments. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I'm sorry, I got a lot of translations I look at, and for some reason my mind doesn't follow my eyes all the time, so I have to go back and, and repeat. We're in the New King James Version. Uh, our God, the one who created all things, created us and gave us breath. He gave these words to Moses, who recorded them for all God's people. Most people will recognize these as the first three commandments. They deal directly with our relationship to God. Number one, we are to put nothing before God. As I said earlier, not cars, not money, not house, your house, not your spouse, not your children, not your dogs. God is always number one. Then your family, then your friends, then you, you go out from there. But it is important that we understand that we will always focus on the most important thing of our life. There's a lot of people today who have one focus on this day. They're all jonesing to get home so they can focus on that one thing. And it's fine to have entertainment in football. They're probably great teams. I personally don't watch much football, but, you know, I know this, the Super Bowl is probably the biggest sporting event of the year. 
for anybody. But it shouldn't replace God. Because with God, it's a Super Bowl every day. Because he's always going to win. You always know who the winner is. So we have to remember to put things in their place. Um, we shall not make or take anything to bow down to. That's number two. That is worship. And it does, um, and it does no matter what. It is. It is. If you bow down or if you focus your whole life around one thing, then that's an idol. Over my lifetime, I've had primarily one thing that I was always at the top of my, on my mind. And it wasn't God. And it's taken a lot of years, not just in becoming a Christian, but to push that aside. Because things that are tangible are so much easier to follow than a God we don't see. And we talk about God all the time, but not knowing God. Because we are a, a people who have sight and sound and touch. Those are our primary things. And we can't do that with any with God. God is 100% faith. Um, the Israelites had a golden calf that they made while Moses was up on the mountain. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a large round statue of a man or a large round man statue. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a sporting team, exercise, hunting. It can even be a cross. If you have to have that cross to properly worship, then that's your idol. If you have to have that picture we've all seen of Jesus bowing at the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, the European Jesus, who he wasn't, but if, if, if we have to have that, then we are worshiping a thing. Um, I personally believe, and again, this is my personal belief, that there's a reason why we don't know what Jesus looks like. Because if we knew really what he looked like, we would worship the picture of him. We would, we would worship the image of him. And that's not how we're supposed to worship. We're supposed to worship, well, we'll get into that deeper later. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Uh, go ahead and turn over to uh, Leviticus chapter 22. Now, number three, uh, that we shall not take the Lord's name in vain. This is more than just cussing. When we think of taking the Lord's name in vain, we always think about cuss words and such as that. Um, but it is so much more. So we're going to be in Levi Le 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 Leviticus chapter 22, which is right after Exodus. The book is... Uh, the chapter is deep into it. And we're going to start in verse 1. If I can, I should have marked mine. But I guess if I don't mark it, then that lets y'all give more time to get there. Unlike Woody, who has his marked and goes, Whew, there we go. It's magic. Uh, verse 1. Then uh, Leviticus tw chapter 22, we're going to be in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel. This threw me off. I, I talked to Lori about it last night. I didn't understand what it was saying. So I went over to the NIV, and basically it says, Speak, <coughs> speak to Aaron and his sons, um, but to treat with respect sacred offerings. So that is what that line, that they separate themselves from holy things of the children of Israel. That's what the NIV says, and, and I understand that better. And they do not profane my holy name by what they dictate to me. I am the Lord. Say to them, whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he has unclean upon him, uncleanliness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. So it's not just what we say. It's what we do. It's how we worship. These different things, whenever we come before the Lord, be it... Just something as simple as um, driving up the street, talking to somebody. These things, if we mi misrepresent the Lord through our worship, which again we've talked about is everything we do, 
then we have profaned his name. Um, and we always have to remember that, that as we've talked about in the past about the apostles and the disciples and these different things, we are disciples of Christ. Whether or not you think of yourself that way or not, you are a disciple. You are a student of Jesus Christ. And when we go out into the world, we represent him. So we have to make sure that we represent him in a holy way, in a righteous way. We are not holy and righteous, but our goal is to work that way, and the Holy Spirit works within us, and God makes us that way as long as we're on his bandwagon and telling people the things that he's told us to say. And that's the key, what God has set, told us to say. Um, if you think about these kind of things, there, there's lots of um, examples in the Bible. Uh, Turn over to Leviticus, turn back to Leviticus chapter 10. And we're going to talk about Nadab and Abihu. Sometimes I wonder why I put these names in here because they're such a challenge to me. All right, so Leviticus chapter 10, it's back 10 chapters. Uh, we're going to be in verse 1 again. <clears throat> and it says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. When we approach God, we must approach him in a holy way. The only reason we are allowed when we leave this earth to stand before him is because we are washed clean with the blood of Jesus. That's the only reason. Because none of us are good enough. When people say that, you know, good people go to heaven, no. Because there's, what, what is good enough? What is the actual good enough level? Where, where is our base to go, okay, this good doesn't go, but this good does? There is none. Because only the blood of Jesus can, can get us into heaven. And God can't be before sin. Um, go ahead and turn over to Second Samuel chapter 6. Um, so our approach should always be anchored in worship. When we come before the Lord, we should always come before the Lord in a worshiping manner. Um, and we always have to remember who God is. And honestly, I think that's where the modern church has really fell down is too many people look at Jesus as the loving hippie. And Jesus loves everybody. Now, there's no proof he ever had long hair. So we don't know if he was a hippie or not. But... The only reason, the only thing that changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament is instead of us having to slaughter thousands of animals in our lifetime, Jesus went to slaughter. And that blood is what gets us there. Other than that, he's the same God. And the only reason it changed is because we don't have the ability to be the people we need to be to get into heaven. Nobody does. You know, it doesn't matter... Even if you're talking about the Pope or Billy Graham, these are just humans. And humans have a sin nature. And we don't lose that until we step into heaven. So um, we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to talk about Uzzah. We're going to be in, uh, no, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. I got too many numbers and not enough in my head. So, okay. All right, so we're going to talk about Uzzah, one of the easier names. And when they came to uh, Nacon's, Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took a hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his era, and he died there by the ark of God. In the world we live in today, that seems really extreme. All he was trying to do was help. 
But again, if you don't come to the Lord in a holy manner, and, and we don't know anything more other than what it says, but we do know that the ark was not being moved in a manner it should have been moved. Um, the Old Testament uh, in Exodus clearly states that the ark should be moved by the Levites. Did I lose my stuff? All right. The ark should be carried only by the Levites. That's the Jewish priestly class. Now, was Uzzah a Levite or not? I don't know. It may say somewhere else, but I couldn't find anywhere where it actually pointed towards that. But it also must be carried by two wooden poles inserted through the rings on, it, on the sides of it. Not a cart, whether new or old, not being pulled by an ox. People were supposed to carry it. Now, if that had been done correctly, would Uzzah have lived? We don't know for sure, but you can bet that he wouldn't have put his arm up there to hold it up because the ox stumbled because there wouldn't have been an ox involved. So how we do things is very important too. Not only our, not meaning, uh, the reason we're doing something may be pure in our heart, but if it's not done the way it's supposed to be done, then it may not be received in that manner. And we've all had that, that, that conversation with somebody to where you go to them in a loving, caring way and they take it as you're attacking them. And, and we can't really compare God to human because his ways are not our ways, but sometimes we have to kind of think in that manner. Um, now, Abraham, so in the Old Testament, uh, the men would build altars and they would sacrifice their best animals in the worship of God. Abraham, later Abram, I mean, Abram, later Abraham did it. Isaac did it. Jacob, who was later Israel, did it. Then Jewish families were called to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate three feasts during the year. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Weeks. Oh, hang on. Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. These three pil pilgrimage pilgrimages uh, everything's hard to say today I don't know what it is uh, but these three pilgrimages were in connection to both uh, the cycle of nature and important um, events that happened in the history of Jewish they were all called to worship daily and go to their local priest for sacrifice but three times a year God wanted the nation of Israel to come together as a people to worship him Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 1. Y'all think Woody uses a lot of scripture. God just pours it on me. And the, reason, and the reason this is so important is you need to know where this stuff is in the Bible. I need to know where this stuff is in the Bible. I'd like to stand here and tell you that I could just look up any scripture anywhere in the Bible in a heartbeat, and I can't. Um, Google is a wonderful thing. If you know enough of what you're looking for, you can Google it. Now, I always, always go back to your Bible and verify that it says what you're being told it says, but Google is a wonderful thing. <coughs> Honey, do you have a cough drop by chance? I sure would appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. My throat is, is having fits. So, that should have given you all plenty of time to get to Isaiah chapter 1. Um, this was the way God commanded people of the Old Testament to worship. Through building an altar, through sacrifice of animal, and through a priest. You had to go to somebody to do the sacrifice to atone for your sins. And then you had your own, you had your own worship with your family. But God wants a relationship with his children, with each and every one of us. He doesn't want mindless slaughter of animals. That wasn't the whole reason why. He didn't want these animals slaughtered to make himself happy. He wanted to show that the cost of sin is death. Even then, and at this point, God doesn't call on human sacrifice. So it was your first, your best um, your unspotted lambs, your bulls, and the, the other animals that you can read through 
um, De 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 Deuteronomy, um, and it talks about the different types of um, sacrifices. The people were not coming to God as a father wanting to repent and looking for forgiveness, but they were coming to God as a deity who needed to be satisfied. We've all seen the old movies. They're throwing people in the volcano because the God needs to be satisfied, so the volcano on a rope. That is the mindset that the people have. God had disciplined the, his people over and over again. He had turned them over time and time again to their enemies. Th that's what the whole Old Testament is about. They go into bondage. They come out of bondage. They go into bondage. They come out of bondage. They go into bondage. They come out of bondage. They're just like my six-year-old grandson. It's a thing that you do over and over and over and over again, and they're still going, I don't understand. You know, it's, it's human nature as we stand here to only see things the way we want to see them, not to see things the way they are, which is a big part of where we're at in our country right now is everybody wants to see the world in their own eyes, but the world is how it is, and we all need to recognize that. And that's how it was for these people because instead of going, God is disciplining me by sending this force in here to take us over, they would go, woe is me. Woe is me. They're just so mean to me. They're just so mean. But it's discipline. Just as we discipline our children, that's how God disciplines his children. So, uh, Israel, Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with inequity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefied sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land and in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion is left as the booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts has left us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. God always leaves a remnant. He always has a small group of people who are still completely and totally faithful to him. Many have tried to wipe the Israelites off the earth. Old Testament time up to modern time. There's still people today who feel like if the Jews were not here, it would be a better world. The Jews are God's chosen people. And people will always come against them and stand against them. And just as we are Christians, people are always going to come and stand against us. And these are things that we have to be prepared for. And what he is saying is these people would be like Sodom and Gomorrah, gone, not here no more. They'd be gone without a trace. Both Sodom and Gomorrah, along with a lot of cities in their proximity, uh, were destroyed so completely that there is no sign of them left. Nobody knows exactly where they're at. There's ideas, there's thoughts, but the actual location, there's nothing. Of all the excava excavation that's been done in that area, they have yet to come up with where it was at. Um, there are some who seem to think that a loving God would never do these things. That a God who truly cares for us would never allow us to suffer the consequences of our sin. That our God worships us and only wants us to be happy. You can turn on TV and go on the internet and there's preachers out there who'll tell you that. God does not want you to be unhappy. God does not want you to be poor. God does not want these things. God wants us to be holy. And sometimes, he, just like we have to discipline our children, he has to discipline us. It ain't always pleasant. 
But I'm telling you, when your final breath comes, you're going to truly appreciate that discipline that you're not where a lot of people are going to end up. Um, because suffering for eternity is a whole lot worse than a little inconvenience. And really, in this country where we live now, any issues we have is an inconvenience. And as we talked about Gigi, she had the inconvenience of the sickness that she went through, but she's being celebrated right now in heaven. So we always have to remember that, that no matter how bad we may think it is here on earth, as long as we get there, that's the most important thing. And, and like I said, you know, there's a lot of past preachers and pastors and ministers and all that that say that, but it's not biblical. As they all say, all you got to do is look at Paul. If you look at Paul and you believe that... Um, Health wealth, health, wealth, and prosperity is what God really wants, then you've got to explain Paul. He, he wrote most of the New Testament. Why would God put somebody he did not want to have health, wealth, and prosperity if that's what God really wants for us? God wants us to be holy. God wants us to stand with each other, love on each other, help each other, and be the light. Um, and he certainly doesn't want us rebelling against him. God loves us. He's long-suffering and truly, truly patient with his children. I never had children of my own. As most of you all know, we're raising our six-year-old grandson. I knew I didn't have patience, but I didn't know how little patience I had until I lived with a little boy. And if you think as you were a child, if you can remember that, or you remember your own children, think of the patience level you have and then think of God's patience with us. The fact that any of us are still here Amen. is grace. And, you know, on, on two occasions I can think of in my head, God was like, why am I even dealing with this? And that's the whole, the whole thing behind the flood. Eight people survived. Just think of that. The world was so bad that only eight people were allowed to live. And that could happen at any time now. Now, God did make the promise with the rainbow, and that's what the rainbow is for. God made the promise that we will never, he will never destroy the earth by water again. But there's a lot of ways to destroy the earth. So we can't be that comfortable because we don't know what's going to happen after he calls us up. And that's why it's so important for us to talk to people. Because, yes, as Christians, we're going to be called up. Jesus is going to remove us from this world, and then it's going to get real bad. But what about those people around us? who we were being nice to and we loved them because we didn't want to upset them because we loved them so much that we didn't want them to, to, to feel bad about themselves. They're going to feel real bad when, when they're standing before Satan and his minions who are going to be in charge of really truly running without the Spirit of God to deflect because if we didn't have the Spirit of God here right now, it would be even a lot worse than it is. Um, Isaiah. Uh, chapter 1. I don't remember if I told y'all to go there or not. I think we already went there. Okay, okay. So now we're going to pick up in verse 10. Uh, see, I just totally lose where I was at. Um, we're going to start Isaiah uh, verse 10 in chapter 1. You rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of our God. You people of Gomorrah, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice to me, says the Lord. What good is constant sacrifice to the Lord if you're going to continue to do the sin that you're taking to the Lord that you're making these sacrifices for? It's none. It, it comes back to that I don't, ask for I don't ask for permission, I ask for forgiveness. And, and he is a very forgiving God. But there comes a point to where are you truly saved if you continue to do these sins over and over and over and over again? We're all going to sin. That's just human nature, and we're all going to battle against that. But if you have that one sin that you will not step away from, and God has made it clear that it's a sin, do you love him? Because if, if, if we truly are saved and we truly have given our, our body, soul, and mind to him, then we love him or we're supposed to, but see, that's another word that the English language doesn't do justice to. We have one word for love, 
I love my wife. I love that snack cake. And, and, and we do say it in the same way. We don't necessarily mean it the same way, but we do say it in the same way. And I think that's where we really have to watch ourselves because many people don't know what true love is. And, and in my opinion, I think probably mothers know closer than anybody else the true love of God because they have given birth to a child. And us men have our children, but we don't have them. We don't go through nine months of, well, we all know, nine months of bad stuff. And the women are always so joyful throughout it. But, you know, we don't deal with those things. So I do believe that, that women probably have a closer knowledge or, or feeling of what true love really is. Because us men, we just want to eat, hang out, watch TV, you know. And, and you know, that, that's reflective in our men's ministries. Uh, and, I, and I hate to say that, but that is a true statement. Uh, and again, I get off on these tangents, but, but the church, the church, would not be where it was at without women. Because men, in many cases, have abdicated their duties. And uh, that's, a, that's a sermon for another day. Um, and I'm sure with us getting ready to kick off a new uh, man church here at the church that uh, it will come. So be ready. Uh, where was I at? Okay. Uh, verse 11, B, I guess you would say, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed calves. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lamb or goats. When you, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? God is asking, who invited you to come here? Now he calls he has called them to come and sacrifice animals to be redeemed for the sins. But if you're not going to repent from your sins and you're going to con continue to do it, why are you even there? That's basically what God is saying. If you're not coming before me in true repentance, then why are you wasting his time and your own time and that poor animal? Because that animal didn't do nothing to deserve what it gets. But, it has, but he was called, we, are called, we were called to do that in the Old Testament to atone for our sins. The same way that if we don't go to uh, God with true repentance now, then why do we call on Jesus who died so we could go before God? Why do we waste his time? Why do we waste our time? If you don't truly mean it, then there's no sense in even talking about it. You can be out enjoying your best life now because if you don't have Jesus, this is your best life now. It's not going to get any better when you leave here. Uh, everybody okay? <laughs> um, he had commanded his people to come before him and give sacrifices. But this is those who truly come to repent. Um, in 1 Corinthians, y'all don't go there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, Paul says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread to drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We must come before a holy Lord with pure intentions and in pure worship. And that's the Lord's Supper, which we will be celebrating next year. I mean, next year. Next Sunday. Uh, yes, next Sunday. Um, but if we go before the Lord without a pure heart and without a pure intention of why we're going before the Lord, then it's better not to go before the Lord at all because he doesn't like being mocked. And... and Again, a lot, a lot of it nowadays is we want people to be happy. We want people to feel good about themselves. We want people to be joyful. And we do. But lying to them and telling them that this is okay when clearly it's not. I mean, God hasn't changed. The Bible hasn't changed. And he made it clear in multiple places in the Bible that we do not change the words, we do not take away the words, and we do not add to the words. It is imperative that we understand it. 
and that we don't just sit in the congregation and listen to the preacher and go, amen, amen, where are we eating? It's time to go eat. And that happens far too often. I'm as guilty of it as, as anybody else. I'll be hungry up here singing going, what am I having for lunch? And that's not how we do this. Um, again, God is very, very patient and very, very forgiving. But as Pastor Woody has said many times, the Bible says you test him in one area, and that's giving. You don't test him in no other area. Uh, let's see, we're in 13. Um, I had kind of threw another scripture in there. So we were, we were moving on to chapter, I mean, verse 13. Uh, bring more futile sacrifices. Incense is bringing no more. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and sa the Sabbath and the calling of assembly. I cannot endure the iniquity of the sac sacred meetings. And, and basically God is just saying, you know what? It's the same old, same old. Y'all come to me. And this happened, like I said, all you got to do is read the Old Testament. It's time and time again. You come before me, you ask for mercy. I give you mercy. And you go do the same thing again. And then you come for me and ask for mercy. I give you mercy. And then you do the same thing again. And it's a cycle. You know, we all live in a cycle. If you look at your life from when you were young to when you were old, you look at the weather, you look at anything, it's all one big cycle. And the key is breaking the cycle. And that's a tough key. Because we get set in our ways, and a lot of times it's not just an emotional or a mental thing. It's a mind thing. Our mind gets in this, like, train tracks. It, it goes where it goes, and we have to remove that and move it off uh, in a different direction. Uh, yeah, Woody, I may need three weeks. I'm nowhere near where I thought I'd be right now. <laughs> um, but we need, to, we need to focus on these things because it is so important so, so important. And I know I get up here, and I, and I think I repeat myself a lot. But this book hasn't changed. And when we talk about this book, what we talk about shouldn't change. What we should talk about is why we're here, who put us here, and what's going to happen when we leave here. And our job, me and Pastor Woody, and Miss Kathy with the Bible study she leads is to make sure that people who don't understand come to understand because it's all going to get to the end and we want to be happy and joyful and, and come together and, and spend time together but we have to worship God we have to spend all of our time everything we do focused on worshiping the great I am the one who created all things Let's turn over to Romans 5. So we talk about the Old Testament sacrifices. And I'll guarantee you there's not a lamb, a goat, a bull, or any of those who come up and said, pick me, pick me. But Jesus did. Jesus came to this earth for one reason. He did ministry while he was here. He healed a lot of people. He'd done a lot of wonderful things. But his whole goal for being here was to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And this is one of those things that we really, really need to understand. Because how can you worship a God if you don't understand why he should be worshipped? God, the Father, created all things. Jesus died so we could come before him. And, you know, you, people ask, why would he do that? Well, it's love. And again, our understanding of love is not the understanding of God's love. Um, true worship only happens when we completely understand what he did, why he did it, and how undeserving we are that he done it. Because when he done it, we were enemies. Paul made it clear that when he died on the cross, actually, that's the... I'm getting ahead. That's the scripture we're into. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. 
Yet, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We did nothing to deserve it. We did not go before the Lord. We did not ask him, and, and, and I'm talking in, in a people sense. The, the, the Israelites did not go before the Lord and say, you know, send a savior. They wanted a warrior is what they wanted. They wanted somebody who was going to, they were, they were earthly minded. They wanted someone to come conquer Rome, conquer their enemies. So they could be the big dogs on the block and they could do these things that the other nations were doing. But God sent his son to take our sins, to pay the debt that we couldn't pay, that animal sacrifice would never pay and die a horrible horrible death on the cross because we're worth it and we're not special we're special in God's eyes but we're not special as far as we deserved it because we didn't it, it's very humbling when you realize that no matter how great we are how great you are in your line of work how great you are as a parent how great you may be as a pastor, that you're just a person that God has allowed to serve him in a way to lift other people up. He loves us a whole lot more than we love ourselves most of the time. And it's very important to worship him in that manner. Not, not you know, not in a way that makes us feel good, but in a way that makes him feel good. All right, so I am running behind. I am going to move on to our scripture, our primary scripture. Is it up there? It was up there. John chapter 4. So while y'all are getting there, I'm going to give a quick overview. Most of you here know this scripture. Uh, we're going to start in verse 20. But Jesus and the disciples were on their way to uh, Judah, uh, from Judah to Galilee, through Samaria. They stopped to take a break in the middle of the day at Jacob's well. Uh, Jesus was tired and thirsty. The disciples go into town to get some food. Jesus stays behind, and a woman comes uh, to the well while the disciples are gone. Jesus asks her for some water, which is odd because Jewish men didn't talk to Samarian women. So as they're talking... The conversation turns to who Jesus is and worship. So we're going to start in verse 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and that was Mount Gerizim. Gerizim. Um, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. This is the woman talking to Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for the salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is we worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Worship in spirit. We hear all the time, or I hear it, and I think a lot of people hear it, is, you know, when, when you talk about well, Pentecostals is always a good place to start. How they jump around, they hop around, they make a lot of noise, they, they, they hoot and holler and all that. That's how they worship. Is it right or wrong? That's how they worship. As long as they are worshiping God. The most important worship we can do is inside of us. What we do outside, raising our hands, bouncing around, not bouncing around, sitting, standing, whatever, none of that matters. It's what we do inside of us. Our spirit must worship God's spirit. God is spirit. Jesus is a man. He's still in his manly form. He's 100% God, but he's still 100% flesh and blood. And then the Holy Spirit is the spirit that lives within us. And the Holy Spirit 
leads our spirit to worship the spirit God. That's his whole job. Jesus left this earth and he was teaching his disciples and he left the Holy Spirit instead of having one Jesus, one human flesh that is walking around and talking to people, we are, each one of us is filled with the Spirit. And there's different denominations that say different things about if you don't do this, that you're not saved, and you don't do that, you're not saved. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you have turned your life over to him, if you have repented of every sin that's in your body, uh, that you have had, if you truly, truly love him and do your best, we're all going to sin. We understand that. But if you're not sinning because you can, you're sinning because the flesh is just strong. And the flesh is strong in so many ways. Jesus is your Lord and you are saved. It doesn't matter if you speak in tongues. It doesn't matter if, if, if you do any of the spiritual gifts. We all have gifts, and God gives each of us our spiritual gifts. A lot of it has to be learned. Um, not in a way like with tongues, I was told, that you just start making noises, and eventually he'll lead you through it. And that's, that's, that, again, that's a, that's a sermon for another day. So if somebody is telling you you must have this gift or you're not saved, that's a lie. That's Satan. Because the way you know if you're saved is that thing a beer, whatever it is, that thing that God has told you in your heart is a sin, you have stepped away from it, and you no longer do it, be it naturally he has removed that from you, or you battle every day not to go back to it. The fact you're battling says there's something changing in you. And that's what happens to us when the Holy Spirit comes within us. We, we change. And we must change. And we must continue to change. Every day, it may not be visual, but every day we should change. Even somebody who's been with God for years, Beverly and Ted, um, they're not here today, but they have both known God since they were children. And I'll guarantee if you talk to them, they know every day they still change closer to him. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. So when we worship, we need to focus on our worship. We don't need to worry about that guy over there on the other side who's losing his mind, hooting and hollering. Well, you know what? That's how he worships. As long as he's worshiping God, that's how he worships. We don't need to worry about the person who's sitting over there who's staring off into space, and you're not even sure if they're aware of what's going on around them. As long as they're worshiping God, then that's how they worship. Because how we worship within us is the most important part. The reason we do things like music and all that is to bring people in to worship, is to set the mood, because we're emotional people. I mean, well, people are emotional. We're emotional people. You know, I guess some animals are emotional too, but as people, we're all emotional. So we, sometimes we need a little boost. It's like I tell my guys in the men's group I'm in when we're going through hard times or whatever, we have to have Jesus to stop the sins in our life but sometimes we need that bit of flesh over here your buddy who will come over and give you a hug so we always worship in spirit but we always need to have our flesh in it some too uh, and again we want people around us to know what we're doing uh, one last scripture I'm skipping a bunch I'm doing a woody today I'm trying to knock some stuff out um, turn over to Revelation chapter 4. So everybody should worship God the way, um, the way we're called to. And it's the way we are personally called to. And, and as you learn the spirit within you and you learn the communication and you learn that, as, as Jesus said, you know, my, my sheep will hear my voice. You will learn that voice. Um, but we all need to worship the way we're called to do it. Just to make, just because, we don't need to worship the way your buddy over here is worshiping or over there because that may not be the way you're called to worship. There are set sins in the Bible. The Ten Commandments, they point it out and it's clear. But as Pastor Woody had said, if the Holy Spirit comes to you and goes, this is a sin, it's a sin. And worshiping like somebody else may not be a sin, but you may not be worshiping God in the way he wants you to worship. 
Again, it's all about God. It's not about your neighbor. It's not about people down the street. It's not about me and Pastor Woody. It's about how God has called you to do it. Uh, all right, so John actually give us a, a glimpse of what worship looks like in heaven. Uh, in Revelation chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. So, after these things I looked, this is John, after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me saying, come here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, and voices. Seven lamps of fires were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four li living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying you are worthy O Lord to receive glory honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created can you imagine what it's going to be like? Everybody has a theory of what heaven's going to be like. This is the only recorded of heaven. Paul said that he was there, but he was not allowed to speak of it. So we know of two of the disciples who actually, I mean the apostles who went, at least in spirit, to heaven. And there's people all over now who claim that they passed and they went to heaven and they come back and telling us of it. And I can't say what they did and did not saw, see, but when Paul says he was not allowed to speak of it, I'm guessing many of the other people who claim to have seen it won't. But the one thing that the book of Revelation lays out is we will be worshiping. I think we'll be working because the Garden of Eden, that's what we did. That's what Adam and Eve did. They worked the earth. They dealt with apparently talking animals because they didn't seem to mind that a serpent was talking to them. So it, it was everybody working together for God. But we will worship and it will be magnificent. And all the things that in our minds that we think that we're going to ask and talk about, when you're standing before the living God, if you truly hold him reverent, you're probably not going to ask many questions. You're just going to worship him. And that's what I plan on doing. Well, whatever he tells me to do is what I plan on doing, which is what I try to do now. But I didn't cover everything I wanted to cover, but I, but I hope that, that we all understand that worship is not a thing. It's not something. The praise and worship team is what my wife and I are called, but we're not. We just lead in the music of the ministry because we lead you in praise and worship. And it's not that anybody needs to teach you how to per se, because you have the Holy Spirit to do that. But sometimes we just have to get in the right mind and focus. Because as people, our minds 
are a terrible thing. And I'm going to leave it at that. Because, you know, it's important that, that we, we learn. It's important that we know. It's important that we have education. Many of us have seen what higher education has done to people. We are, we are simple people. We are here to serve each other. We are here to help each other. And we are here to worship God. And I believe that even though God has given us all the glories of science and technology, it has skewed a lot of people's minds. But uh, I'm going to cut that short there. And, uh, but I got next week, so y'all going to get more on next week too. So I'm, I'm actually excited. Um, uh, and next week we are going to get into, hopefully, or the week after that, or the week after that, eventually we're going to actually start talking about the music, which was originally what I had got into to do this. So if you don't know Jesus or you thought you knew him and now you're starting to wonder if you really knew him, it's important that you get into the Bible, get into Bible study, and really learn who he is. Because I've said it in many of my sermons. Woody has said it, and I've heard it, heard it many times. There's a lot of people who think they're going to stand before the Lord and hear, uh, well, John, good and faithful servant. And they're going to hear, be gone, because I never knew you. And that's going to be a sad, sad day. So let's all know God. Let's know Jesus. Let's not pretend to know him. Let's not think we know him. Let's know we know him. Um, gentlemen, if you'll remove your hats, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the words. I thank you for the time. I thank you for your son. I thank you for the book. I thank you for the breath. You have supplied us with everything we need. And I just thank you so much for allowing us to come before you, to worship you, to praise you. I ask that every single person in here who knows you, that the Holy Spirit will, will rise up within them, Lord, and that will lead them in the direction that you have called them to, to lead. Not, not their, their parents may tell them or you know, their kids or whoever may be around them, I ask that you will lead them to what you have called them to do. I thank you for allowing us to gather like this. There are many, many in the world today who aren't allowed to do that. I just pray that you'll touch the lives of the people who are out there who don't know you, that you will lead them to you, that you will put somebody in their life to touch your life. If anybody here doesn't know you, or if anybody's watching doesn't know you, I ask that you'll consider making Jesus your Lord and Savior. And if you're ready to do that, I ask that you'll repeat these words that I say. Now, these words will not save you. What's in your heart will save you. But these words will be your, your, your vocal, um, these will be the words that will lead you spiritually to do that, Lord. Sometimes we have to hear things to be able to put them into their proper perspective. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn, my sin, I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your glorious, glorious name, I ask this 